All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, you guys. Thanks for hanging in with our little technical difficulties. We love technology. We love the new software and we love UW Extension for teaching us all of this new technology. We have two awesome presentations in this section today. So first up, we're going to have Jesse Landwehr with a virtual hatchery fish tour. And Jesse works for the Wisconsin DNR for the Wild Rose Fish Hatchery. So just remember as we go, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A tab. It's at the top right of your screen. That's the one I'm gonna be monitoring for questions. So you wanna take it from here, Jesse? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Emily. Um, a little background about myself. Uh, I'm Jesse Landwer. I'm the hatchery supervisor here at Wild Rose and also the supervisor of the work unit that involves our spawning facilities up at Kiwani um, on Lake Michigan. We're happy to be here today, happy to fill you guys in and kind of let you know a little bit about what we do here at the hatchery and uh, what, what the fish propagation program does throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, we'll start off uh, I've got a little video that we were working on over the past year trying to put together a virtual tour of the hatchery um, because we every year we get you know thousands of people that show up at the fish hatchery that come in see the fish see the old historic hatchery and we have a great uh, visitor center that that was here um, but with COVID this year that kind of put the kibosh on a lot of public coming but we still had a lot of requests from school groups you know uh, angler groups things like that to have something to provide. So we were able to work with our uh, our media program and they came up, we were able to put together a, a kind of a snapshot video for what we do here at the hatchery. So we'll roll through that uh, first. And then I've got a few uh, slides that can kind of talk about our production here at the hatchery. Um, and after we're done with that, if we got a little bit of time, we'll field any questions that you guys have. So I will... Uh, kick off the video and, and we'll get rolling. Located in central Wisconsin, the Wild Rose Fish Hatchery sits just outside of the historic town of Wild Rose. First built in the early 1900s, Wild Rose was chosen as the hatchery location because of the abundance of artesian flow, where the hatchery could take advantage of the source of cold, natural spring water. In the early 2000s, the hatchery underwent two phases of construction and was renovated into the hard-working hatchery it is today. There are basically two hatcheries at Wild Rose, a cold water hatchery and a cool water hatchery. The cold water hatchery is on the west side of Highway 22, and the species raised there are Chinook salmon, coho salmon, rainbow trout, and brown trout. On the east side of the highway is the cool water hatchery, where muskellunge, northern pike, lake sturgeon, and walleye are raised. The key to the success of any fish hatchery is the location and quality of the water supply. The Wild Rose Fish Hatchery is equipped with six high capacity wells. There are four wells that supply the cold water hatchery and two wells that supply the cool water hatchery. Together they're capable of pumping up to 5,000 gallons of high quality water per minute. The water that is pumped out of the ground is a consistent 49 degrees all year and is perfect for cold water fish culture which is where we are going to start our tour. Before anyone or anything can be brought into the hatchery, we need to consider the biosecurity. Biosecurity refers to steps we take to keep viruses and bacteria out of the hatchery. We practice this by setting up checkpoints at every door, where employees must disinfect their boots and use hand sanitizer. Now that we've been properly disinfected, let's go into the building. There are three main areas within the cold water building, the biosecurity chamber, the heat incubators, and the start tanks. When the eggs first arrive at the hatchery, they are brought into the biosecurity chamber. The biosecurity chamber is used to disinfect the eggs using iodine. This kills any viruses or bacteria that may be on the eggs before they can be brought into the heat incubators. Once the eggs have been disinfected, they can be put into the heat incubators. Wild Rose has 40 vertical incubators where the eggs are incubated on well water, which 
is a constant 49 degrees Fahrenheit. Each incubator has 16 trays, where water starts on the top tray and flows down to the trays below. Each year, 4 to 5 million eggs start their journey at the hatchery in these heath incubators. After about 30 days, the eggs reach a point where we must remove the bad eggs from the good ones using an automated egg picker. This picker has an electronic eye that senses the bad white eggs and removes them from the lot, leaving only the good eggs. After another week or two on the incubators, the eggs start to hatch on the trays. The eggshells that are left on the trays need to be removed, along with any unhatched eggs. Although the fry have hatched, they have not yet fully developed. Over the next 30 to 45 days, they will live off their yolk sac and become more active, and eventually start to swim. Once they get to this point, they will be moved from the incubators to the start tank for their first feeding. Before being stocked into the start tanks, the fry are taken out of the trays and cleaned once more. At this point, their yolk sacs are almost completely gone, and the fry will need to be fed a commercial pellet. After a few days of being in the tanks, they are considered feed trained and will all start to actively feed. The main purpose of the cold water building is to incubate the eggs and get the fish feed trained and feeding through the first few months of their lives. After that, the fish will be moved into the grow out portion of the cold water hatchery. There are four large pavilions at Wild Rose that house 16 raceways. As we start to use these larger rearing units, we need more water. This ensures there is enough oxygen for the fish and that the flows are fast enough to flush out fish waste. After the water is used in one pavilion, it is reused again by the pavilion below it. We use the water five times before it gets treated and discharged into the river. This helps reduce the amount of water that we need to produce two million fish annually. Before we stock any fish, we need to make sure they are healthy and disease free. Fisheries veterinarians are on hand to examine the fish and take samples to test for pathogens. This is done to make sure we are not endangering the fish populations in the waters where these fish will eventually call home. Once the fish have a clean bill of health, we sane them from the raceway, load them onto a truck, and safely stock them around the state. We're going to start our journey on the cool water side the same way the fish do, in the cool water building. The cool water building is divided into four different areas, the biosecurity chamber, the incubation area, start tanks, and grow out tanks. Cool water fish species incubate in much shorter periods and at warmer temperatures than cold water fish. We can incubate cool water eggs anywhere from 49 to 70 degrees, depending on the species and stage of development. We incubate the cool water eggs in a McDonald jar, where the water upwells through the eggs and keeps them at a gentle roll. Once the fry hatch, they are brought to the start tanks, where they will become feed trained, similar to the cold water fish. Cool water species need temperatures between 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit to grow well, which means we must heat the water. The only way this is economical is by using a recirculating aquaculture system, also referred to as an RAS, which reuses 95% of the water, reducing the amount of water that needs heating. An RAS works by first passing the water over the fish. As the water passes through the fish tanks, the fish consume the food and oxygen that is in the water, all the while excreting feces, ammonia, and carbon dioxide. First, the water is passed through a drum filter that catches the solid waste products and removes them. The water then passes through the biological filter which contains billions of nitrifying bacteria, whose job is to convert ammonia to nitrate. The biological filter also has aerators in it that remove the carbon dioxide produced by the fish. After passing through the biological filter, the water enters a pump that pushes it through an ultraviolet sterilizer which kills bacteria and fungus. Once the water passes through the UV sterilizer, it is pushed up to the vacuum degasser where oxygen is added back to the water. The water is then collected in the head tank and from there the reconditioned water will recirculate back to the fish and the process will repeat all over again. After the fish are feed trained in the start tanks, they are moved to the larger grow out tanks. As the fish grow, we need to thin, sort, and move them within the cool water building to keep them from getting too crowded. The lake sturgeon are fed a combination of live and frozen food, such as krill and bloodworms. 
The muskie, northern pike, and walleye that are raised in the cool water building are fed a similar commercial pellet as the cold water fish. A portion of the fish that are raised in the cool water building are stocked into the wild, while others are stocked into ponds and fed live minnows before they are harvested and stocked out. Moving to the other aspect of cool water fish culture, Wild Rose has 14 rubber lined ponds that are used for cool water fish. They are filled with well water from the wells on the cool water side of the hatchery. The two species that are reared in these ponds are walleye and muskie. Fathead minnows are brought in from minnow farms in Arkansas as well as from the pothole prairie ponds of the Dakotas and stocked into our cool water ponds for the fish to eat. Thousands of pounds of forage are brought in each week to feed the muskie and walleye. The minnows are tested and certified clean before they are allowed into the hatchery to make sure that we are not putting our fish at risk of any pathogens. The minnows are loaded before sunrise and are driven to the hatchery and are swimming in ponds shortly after lunch. As the summer progresses, we sample fish to see how they are growing. A seine is pulled through the pond to catch a couple dozen fish that are placed into a bucket. From there we measure and weigh the fish to record their growth, as well as observe the fish for overall condition and health. Every year fisheries biologists request fish for their counties by submitting stocking quotas. We use these data to know how many fish we need to produce and the locations of their final stocking destination. Once the fish are the appropriate size and water temperatures cool in the fall, the ponds are harvested. Fish are collected by seine and loaded onto a distribution truck. For harvesting the muskie, we carry nets of fish to the top of the pond where we count each fish before they go onto the truck. Being popular with many anglers and also the state fish, muskie often receive passive integrated transponder tags or pit tags. Each pit tag has a number that is recorded once it has been inserted into the muskie. The fish receives a fin clip so that when the fish is caught in the wild years later, we know that it has a pit tag. The fish can then be scanned for a pit tag number, which will provide us with information like the age of the fish, as well as the date and location where the fish was stocked. When we harvest our walleye ponds, we have a fish pump that does the heavy lifting for us. The walleye are loaded into a hopper in the pond, and a pump lifts the fish up the side of the pond, and they are sent to a dewatering tower. The water that is carrying the fish falls through the grates while the fish slide down the bars. When the walleye make it to the end of the dewatering tower, they drop into a pipe that slides the fish into the distribution truck. Once the truck is loaded with fish, they are stocked into their requested water. Each year, over 150 truckloads of fish leave wild rows and are taken to every corner of the state. Since 2010, the Wild Rose Fish Hatchery has stocked fish in 59 of the 72 counties in Wisconsin. Nearly all of the cold water fish are stocked into Lake Michigan, while the cool water fish are stocked into both Lake Michigan and inland waters. Stocking is part of an integrated approach to managing a water body. It helps ensure the protection of self-sustaining fish populations. Through stocking, we hope to increase specific fish populations so they can eventually sustain themselves through natural reproduction. We also stock fish so anglers can catch them. We stock smaller fish in the hopes that they will one day grow and eventually contribute to a water's adult fish population. But we also stock larger, legal-sized fish in put-and-take fisheries, so anglers can catch and harvest these fish immediately. Whether the goal for stocking is to help restore fish populations or to make more fish available for anglers to catch, our hope is that the fish we raise at Wild Rose and that are eventually stocked into our waters will not only survive, but thrive to make Wisconsin's fishing better. Um, so hopefully it kind of gives you a, a, a 
recap of what what happens here at Wild Rose. Um, like I said, we we raise probably we have the most diverse fish population that we raise here at Wild Rose. A lot of our other hatcheries throughout the state, uh, which do you know a couple of different species, but here at Wild Rose, we do a, a whole lot of everything. Uh, we do Chinook salmon, coho salmon, brown trout, and steelhead for Lake Michigan stocking. Uh, we also raise walleyes, northern pike, and muskies. Uh, walleyes, northern pike, muskies, and lake sturgeon for inland stocking in the state. Um, but wild rose is, is just one part of our state propagation program. We can't do it all by ourselves, and we, we uh, quite literally don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. Fish eggs are the same as anything else. So we try to pr provide, or provide our production across the state at a lot of different facilities. Um, currently, we have six dedicated cold water facilities. They raise trout and salmon for stocking in public waters of the state. Um, three facilities that are dedicated to cool water. So they're doing uh, walleyes, northerns, and muskies. And then like what we have here at Wild Rose, there are two facilities that do a combination of cold and cool water fish. Uh, to support all of that, we also have for Lake Michigan, we have three spawning facilities that are on the shores of Lake Michigan. Uh, Sturgeon Bay, uh, Strawberry Creek and Sturgeon Bay, Kiwani River and the Root River are our gamete collection facilities where the fish that are naturally, or the fish that are, have been stocked out into Lake Michigan have a spot to return to so we can collect eggs and, and fertilize eggs and have our progeny for following years come up. Uh, we do also have four facilities that have been closed down uh, over the past 10 years or so uh, because of shifts in uh, stocking strategies or staffing issues, um, funding shortages, things like that. So overall, the state has, you know, 13 or 14 different facilities um, that we can have in operation on any given year. Looking back a little bit on statewide production, um, for 2019, the state of Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources produced about over 2.7 million walleye that were stocked in the public waters. And everything that we do is stocked only into public waters. We don't do any private fish sales. Uh, so basically, I like to think that all of the fish that we're raising are bought and paid for with last year's fishing licenses. Uh, just over a million brown trout were stocked in 2019, 830,000, 828,000 Chinook salmon, almost 700,000 rainbow trout, and that's inland and Lake Michigan, uh, 360,000 coho salmon, about 330,000 brook trout, and those are all primarily inland stocked, uh, 72,000 largemouth, 334,000 pike, 190,000 lake trout, 62,000 muskies, 66,000 splake, and almost 60,000 lake sturgeon. So out of the DNR facilities alone, we put out about 6.8 million fish in 2019. Uh, we also team up with our cooperator groups and we stock, uh, we have co-op programs throughout the state where we, the Department of Natural Resources provides sportsmen's clubs, angling clubs, municipalities with small fingerling fish. They provide the labor to care for them and the feed to take care of them for the year and then we can go back in and, and stock those fish out in the fall or the spring, depending on when they're going. Um, it's a great asset to the community, uh, kind of provides a, a resource uh, that the local groups are, are having an impact. And it provides us with additional rearing space that we wouldn't otherwise, excuse me, that we wouldn't otherwise have. So our co-op groups attribute, uh, uh, contribute another 74,000 brook trout 30,000 lake trout, 38,000 browns, and 8,000 walleyes. So that's another 150,000 fish that are on top of what, what the DNR produces. So we're right around 7 million fish for the anglers of Wisconsin to go out and pursue. To kind of put that in reference, that's a little more than one fish per person that lives in the state, um, or about five fish per licensed angler. Kind of looking at what we have planned for wild rose for this year. Um, you can see the, the little green fish there, that's Washera County. We're pretty centrally located throughout the state. We have a pretty diverse 
uh, species mix that we, we raise here at Wild Rose. Uh, so this coming year, we'll produce about 470,000 brown trout. We stack those into 12 different counties. 1.2 million Chinook salmon, those go, are going into Lake Michigan along the 10 counties that border Lake Michigan. Um, 500,000 coho salmon stocked into the eight counties right on Lake Michigan proper. We'll stock about 32,000 lake sturgeon in nine counties. There is a little asterisk by that one because we have not yet gotten approval to go out and spawn lake sturgeon. Uh, we've got approval for everything else, but we're still waiting to see if our, our COVID protocols are, are gonna be sufficient to be able to, to spawn sturgeon this year. Um, We've got about 55,000 muskies and those are stocked into 17 different counties, 194,000 pike in 19 counties throughout the state, 108,000 steelhead and those are stocked in the Lake Michigan as well. And we'll plan on producing about 138,000 walleyes and those are stocked in 13 different counties throughout the state. So overall, that gives us about 2.7 million fish that come out of wild rose um, between that will be stacked between this spring and next spring. Uh, and we hit 42 of the 72 counties of Wisconsin with fish that come out of wild rose. So that's kind of the, the quick and dirty of what, what we do here at Wild Rose. Um, if there's any questions, we can, we can field those now or, or catch them at the end. Yeah, I think we have time for a quick couple here. That was astonishingly complex. Thank you for sharing that with us, Jesse. One of the no questions problem. we have here uh, is in regards to the cooling system that you have for the cool water ponds. Someone's just kind of wondering if you have shade covers over the ponds or do you just take the sun's heating into account when you determine those flow rates of groundwater in? Um, we actually depend on that solar heat to warm those ponds up. Um, on our cool water ponds, those are just filled with well water. So it's coming out of the ground at, you know, 48, 49 degrees, pretty much year round. Walleyes, northerns, muskies, any of those cool water species really prefer it to be a lot warmer than that. So we will fill those ponds, heat them up just by solar heat. And then if we need to cool them back down again, we'll fire the wells back up and add more water to them. But with our cool water species, well, with any species of fish, the warmer it is, if you're within that range of that they're happy, the faster they'll grow. So we can take a fish like a, a trout that will be from hatch to stock out they will over 18 months, we'll get them to grow seven or eight inches. In contrast, we can get a muskie because they're out in that warmer water to go from hatch to about 12 inches long in about five, six months. So we don't chill the ponds, we don't shade the ponds at all. Um, basically, we kind of let mother nature do its thing and warm the ponds up as much as we can and then regulate it with well water after that if we have to. Awesome, and then another question is, the last question we have here is, if there are private companies that raise fish that are suitable for stocking into public waters, and I bet that person's also wondering if those companies are also as stringent as yours are with their processes. Uh, yep, there are. Um, what we do, we actually have genetic management plans in place for all the public waters throughout the state. So, you know, fish aren't like birds and mammals. They can't move from place to place. So over time, what's happened is they've kind of become genetically predisposed to the waters that they're in. So we look at that and say, all right, if, if mother nature has got them conditioned so they're going to be surviving in the Wisconsin River drainage, we shouldn't be taking fish from the Mississippi River drainage or the, the uh, Lake Michigan drainage and putting them into those other waters. So we have pretty stringent protocols as far as what fish can get stocked where throughout the state. Um, some of those fish are available through private fish farms. Um, there, there's a very big industry in Wisconsin of raising fish for stocking into to public and private waters. Um, we just require that they have to have the right genetic management strain for stocking. And we partner up with some of those private fish farms. Um, anybody that's looking to stock like private ponds, you would reach out to uh, the Wisconsin Aquaculture Association is a good resource. They have a list of um, 
of private fish farms throughout the state and what they raise and what they can put you in touch with for, for purchasing those. But we do pair up and with the walleye initiative that we had a few years back, we actually are also purchasing fish from some private fish farms throughout the state too for stocking in the public waters. Just because with all the pond space that we have, we don't have quite enough pond space to raise and stock as many walleyes as what's needed. Great. Well, those were all the questions that we had. We had a couple comments that said you uh, broke down those very complex ideas very nicely. So we definitely right. do appreciate that. Thank you, Jesse, so much for that very interesting tour. Next Thanks. up Thanks. on the docket, we have Ben Martin. And Ben is going to give us a crash course in using the Wisconsin Fish IDs tool. So Ben is giving this talk. He's a PhD student at UW-Madison, teaching us about this fascinating tool. Again, if you have any questions during this, um, please go to the Q&A tab that's on the top right of your screen. And also know that for Ben's, part of Ben's talk today, he does have a couple poll questions. So there is a poll question that's right next to the Q&A tab. And Ben will be prompting us uh, as to when he would like us to take those polls. And then he'll be letting us know when he wants to know the results of them. Right, Ben? Yep, that sounds good. It might be a little shaky, but we'll get through it. All right, have at it, Ben. All right, so I'm Ben Martin. I'm a PhD student at the Center for Limnology down in UW Madison. Um, and today, yeah, I'm going to take you through the Wisconsin Fish ID tool. Um, so just for reference here, um, this is the Center for Limnology down in Madison on the shores of Mendota. Um, this is a very old historical program, um, a lot of limnology coming out of the center. And so that's where I am located. And a little bit of background on me. Obviously, we can't all meet at this uh, meeting, so I think this is important. Um, so I study food webs, invasive species, um, and I really enjoy outreach and teaching um, more people about some of the things that I'm passionate about, particularly just knowing what um, different species of fish you might catch or find in stomachs of other fish. Um, and I'll highlight that with some examples of uh, why I use the fish ID tool pretty often. So a lot of this is coming from uh, my teaching obligations here at UW. Um, so I teach an upper level uh, taxonomy class called Ecology of Fishes. And in that class, we do 76 species uh, ID. And so this is what a lot of our labs look like. Um, it's usually group based. They have these jars of specimens um, and they're trying to work through uh, what, what the fish are exactly. And you can see a couple Hands on the heads there can be frustrating, but that's all part of fish ID. Um, and I think sort of struggling through fish ID is something uh, everyone goes through. So uh, Wisconsin, we are um, very blessed with the many resources we have uh, for teaching fish ID. Um, one of the classics is here shown Fishes of Wisconsin, the George C. Becker um, key. And this was, uh, this is a long time used in Wisconsin, and it is based on the idea of answering many questions in a dichotomous key fashion, um, where it asks you the shape of the fish, different characteristics, and you answer all these questions and eventually it'll tell you what fish species that is. Um, and so that's sort of a, a classic way to identify fish. Um, a way I was sort of brought up was with this, the Peterson guide. Um, there's many of these to plants, uh, freshwater fish, um, trees. Um, so this is a very classic guide where you sort of go into it thinking, I know this is some sort of panfish. I know this is some sort of trout. So you sort of flip through and um, you look at these color illustrations and you can figure out sort of what um, fish you might have or leaf or um, whatever it is. Yeah, and then the Wisconsin Fish ID tool will be sort of a, a more hybrid model from these two. Um, so the first thing I want to do here is just sort of gauge our confidence in Fish ID. So that is using the first poll, um, I believe. So it should just be, yeah, one to five. What is your um, general confidence in Fish ID with sort of one being, you know, I know what a bluegill is. Um, I generally know what the trout I catch are. Um, three being, you might be able to tell some of the sunfish species apart. You might know some of the forage fishes, um, you sort of try and match with your baits, or five being, you know, you know, all these different minnow species. 
Um, maybe something on the bottom there, like a bow fin that many people haven't heard of. Um, I think it's good to gauge that confidence and we'll come back to this question at the end um, after we've gone through the, the tool. So I'll give you another little bit to fill that out. And we want to post assessment, just like a true teacher. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I don't know if we can share the results there, if that's yeah. possible. Yep. Oh, well, I can see them on my screen and I have that for one star that was 31% of folks. Well, 39 now because votes are still streaming in here. Uh, two stars, 11 folks or 11% of people. It looks like three stars, 33% of people, 11% percent of people gave four and five percent only one person gave a five star so the most was definitely between one or three stars yeah and that's that's great and it's good to know because um yeah there's different techniques for using this this wisconsin fish id tool so i think one of them will probably be preferred amongst most of you all right so now we'll get into um what is diversity of fishes in wisconsin even look like um, and so there's another poll question. I think it might be a couple ahead. It might be like question three, um, but it's just gauging how many fish do you think there are in Wisconsin? Um, and then I will um, zoom out a little bit and uh, sort of compare this across the country. Um, but this is a poster that's at the uh, Zoological Museum here at UW. Um, they're on these large canvas prints and this displays uh, the, the many fish that we have. So this could kind of be that game where you guess out of a mason jar how many candies are in it. Um, do we have any results for that poll yet? Um, it doesn't look like anyone has answered that one yet. Let's see here. The first two polls are the same, so we're going to get rid of that. So let's see here. What's to do? All right, now the guesses are coming in. How many fish species? It looks like most people think that the answer is D, 183. You guys got it. There is. So yeah, there's approximately 183 um, different fish species. I say approximately because um, taxonomists, we continue to argue what is a species. Um, there's some fish in the Great Lakes that we have these subspecies, what's a hybrid. We continue to get non-native species um, added. And so, yeah, it was somewhere around 183. And so if we zoom out and ask, you know, what does that look like across the US? Um, we're kind of an intermediate. Um, we're this yellow orange spot here. Um, and this sort of comes a lot from us having the Mississippi River, which is a highly diverse watershed. Um, you notice the highest species diversity sort of down here in Tennessee, Louisiana, um, up into Arkansas. And so, um, this is a lot of fish, 183 is, is definitely a lot, and it's a lot more than where I was coming from. Um, I did my undergrad here in central Pennsylvania, and we were actually right on the divide of the Appalachians and uh, the Mississippi drainage, and so we actually didn't have many species. And so where I sort of cut my teeth doing fish ID was a lot easier than it was here. Um, but I've really had a good time uh, learning all these different fish since coming here to Wisconsin. All right, so now let's get into the fish ID tool. So this came about uh, Sea Grant and Wisconsin DNR. Um, these biologists came together and designed this, uh, this app essentially. And so if you have your phone, you can take a, you can pull up the QR code with your camera and it should take you to the website um, or the link is down there at the bottom. But in this tool, essentially within your pocket of your iPhone or Android, um, you have 174 fish um, species and all the information that goes with them. And so I think one of the best things is you have this thousands of fish photo base for every fish species. Um, so one of the sort of leading fish ID experts in Wisconsin is John Lyons. Um, and so he has sort of approved all these photos that this is a bluegill, this is a brown trout. And so with high confidence, you can go into that app and pull a photo and know what it is. And this is really good because if you just randomly Google species on Google, um, you're gonna, if Google Photos will pull all kinds of stuff and, and you may be misled. And so I often use the app mostly just to look at the photos of fish that are sort of confirmed for me. 
a feature is that this app runs offline. Um, so if you're way up in the Northwoods, like I'm in the field, I have this app downloaded on my iPad. Um, if I'm in the field and I don't have service, everything is preloaded onto your phone. Now, the only disadvantage to that is it takes up significant space. Um, so it's about 300 megabytes, which actually isn't that much for most newer phones. Um, we're sort of reaching much higher storage limits in phones as we keep improving the technology. Um, but that's really, really nice as if I don't have service, I still have the tool um, and all of its features, all the photos are already preloaded. Again, it's Apple and Android compatible, so you're covered there. And rumor has it, uh, there is a coming update um, to this app. Um, there was a survey going around sort of asking different people, um, things they liked about it and things they wish could be improved. So um, that is still hopefully being worked on there. So now let's get into what this app looks like. The first um, thing you're gonna notice on the interface is you have two sort of directions you can go as far as how you wanna identify your species. The first one is by name and the second is by appearance. And so the first one, which is by name, um, I don't find as helpful. And I think many, uh, especially beginning people may not find it very helpful at all. Um, it lists all almost 200 fish species. Um, you can search them. So if you think you know it's a, a perch, you can go search that and it'll pull all the information up for perch. Um, but essentially you have to sort of scroll through there um, in order to find your fish. And so that's not super helpful unless you go in knowing, um, for example, you're fishing and you catch a fish and uh, your buddy says, oh, that's a rock bass. And you're like, I don't know if it actually is. You can go search rock bass and go right to there. Um, and be able to tell whether it is or isn't that fish. But the way I want to mostly highlight for this talk is by appearance. And I think this is super slick. Um, and it is this hybrid of the original Becker key that made you ask and answer several questions um, about the fish you have versus sort of a field guide where you would sort of go to a group of fish that you think it might be and then sort of, um, yeah, sort of go through and figure out which one it actually is. So just real quick here, by name, this is sort of what the interface looks like. By name, it's going to be alphabetical and it's just going to, it'll show you a picture of the fish and then the name. Um, and so if you click on one of these, you will then get the species specific profile of it. Um, so yeah, you clicked on rock bass here and you'll have more information, which we'll get to. But essentially, once you click and get to the one species uh, page, by name or by appearance will give you, get you to the same place. Um, so it's all about determining which fish you want to click on to find more information. So by appearance, again, I think this is super helpful. Um, I think the one hurdle essentially is that it does use some basic fish ID terminology. Um, however, uh, not only will we cover those key terms, but it does in the app also give you a brief description of what it um, is actually asking for that question. And then down here, it'll say view, view all fish. And so as you click and add characteristics, it will narrow down your searches um, where it might say, well, there are 20 fish that have those two characteristics. And so you can go and then look and say, okay, can I figure out which fish it is based on the pictures and the descriptions? And so this brings me to probably the biggest pro tip that I have to remind uh, my students of is if you aren't sure of a characteristics, of one characteristic, don't put that as an answer. The only way you can definitely not find the right fish is if you misidentify some feature. So if you say the body shape is, is X, but it's actually Y, um, it, when you go click search results, it will not have the right fish. Um, so you wanna sort of be selective of which ones um, you think, you feel confident you can describe and then it's sort of playing this balance of, okay, can I pick it out of a lineup of 30 versus maybe 10 or 15? So the first one is gonna be mouth shape. And this is probably gonna be the longest one. Um, again, all these different terminologies have these little descriptions down here. So I don't expect most people to know what a terminal mouth is, um, but what it tells us is mouth is on the end of the snout. And so essentially that's just facing forward. Um, and then you just look at the photo there and you say, okay, the mouth, yeah, it faces forward. Um, this is like the most common looking fish mouth. Versus down here, we have subterminal mouth is on the underside of the snout. And you notice the mouth is, it's kind of this 
uh, cut off head and the mouth is underneath there. And you work your way, you have superior, this sucker-like mouth, which is described as having lips. And many of you can probably figure out a sucker-like mouth will narrow you down to the sucker family. And so what you'll notice as you start moving towards the bottom of the list is you're getting more and more specialized uh, characteristics. And so what I wanna emphasize is that if you have a fish, the first thing I always ask about is what's different about that fish? What's different looking? Um, does it have this long paddle shaped mouth, which I think most of us um, know that's a paddle fish. So if you click that, there's only gonna be one answer. Um, so that's really easy. Uh, so yeah, sort of the pro tip is ask what's most different and enter those characteristics first because you're gonna more narrow down your potential search results. So an example here is, um, let's say my fish has this short duck build mouth. So I click on that. And then down here, it's gonna tell me that there are only three fish in Wisconsin that have that characteristic. And so I say, okay, let me see what those look like and make sure I didn't mess something up. Um, and so we have the muscalunge, the grass pickerel and the Northern Pike. Um, and something I noticed the coloration is quite different here. Um, the size of the grass pickerel is much smaller once we get into the specific uh, fish details, which I'll get to. Um, but very quickly, what it is trying to do is depicted in this comic here, um, where we're trying to sort of this police lineup. Um, and I believe what this comic is showing is uh, the police are lining up these different fish and there's an angler there that um, is trying to identify either which fish uh, stole its bait, stole, stole some, some line from them. Um, but essentially you wanna try and narrow your search results down into this kind of police lineup so you can figure out um, what, what fish you have, or at least have an idea of, yeah, these are the three or four different fish it could be, depending on what level of uh, information you're looking for. So the next one is back spines. You notice as we're going here, the number of options are gonna go down. Um, so mouth is not always the most super helpful, but back, back spines is a very easy one. Um, but again, there's a little bit of terminology that comes with it. So spines will poke you. Uh, if anyone's handled a bluegill before, you can get stabbed in the finger by a bluegill and it, it can uh, draw some blood. Um, whereas there are also rays on fish. And so rays are super flexible and they're gonna be frayed at the ends. And so rays can't poke you. Um, so for this question, the easiest way to sort of tell whether a fish has no spines is typically the spines at the very, very front of the top fin of the fish. And so you can sort of poke there. And if there's, there's no, nothing there that's poking you, there's no spines. Um, and so no spines is actually a pretty good characteristic to narrow you into a couple families of fish. Um, similarly, one spine and then more than one spine, um, so typically like a bluegill, um, a rock bass shown there. And then we get into this splitting point of more than one spine, but whether or not there is membrane connecting them. Now, if there's no membrane connecting them, that's a pretty uh, not super common fish. Um, so you probably won't pick that one, but most of the time it will be this more than one spine with connecting membrane. But let's say we do have a fish that we think matches that characteristic of more than one spine without membranes. Um, what it quickly brings you to is, is these three species of sticklebacks. And so this is what I sort of mean by what level of information are you looking for? You know, if you find this fish in a fish stomach, you probably don't really care if it's a nine spine versus a three spine versus a brook stickleback. You just want to know it's a stickleback. Um, so pretty quickly, you can say, um, you know, it's a stickleback and move on. And that's, and that's fine. And in many situations, that is uh, what I do. So just to sort of ecology fun fact here is back spines are actually a predator defense. Um, so many of these characteristics it's asking you about is related to the fish's ecology. So in the case of a bluegill, the reason a bluegill has so many spines is that that is able to prevent um, a fish from eating it much easier. So as soon as it flares its spines out, it takes a much bigger mouth to fully grasp um, that bluegill. So moving on, we have tail shape. Um, I don't find this to be a very helpful one. Um, for a couple of reasons, um, but it gives you these three options, rounded, forked, and square. Um, many of you may look at square and rounded and not super well tell the difference, um, and I don't. Um, but tail shape can uh, vary considerably between individual fish. 
Um, and tails are often damaged, especially during spawning times where they often will use their tails um, in order to sort of build beds and whatnot. Um, so I generally don't um, use this characteristic unless I'm absolutely sure. Like this forked one is, is pretty obvious um, and much different than the other two. But again, tail shape will give you insights into the fish's ecology. Um, whereas a forked tail um, does not have a whole lot of sort of lateral surface area because there's a fork in it. Um, whereas a rounded one has a ton of surface area. And so every time a fish sort of moves that back tail, um, it's gonna move a lot more water. So it can accelerate really, really well. So we generally associate this with fish that are hanging around weeds and are sort of ambush predators. Um, so the next is body shape. Um, again, this can be helpful in some cases when it's a more unique body shape. But for the most part, most are going to be fusiform. Think of just a general fish, you, little stick figure fish you would draw. Um, yeah, most of them are football shaped. Um, and football shape can sometimes blend into lateral compression, um, something like a largemouth bass or rock bass. And so it might not be super obvious. And again, as soon as you click the wrong selection here, um, it will narrow your results uh, to something it's not. So the other one here is going to be, uh, oh yeah, so the lateral compression, um, again, thinking about that tail, is as soon as a fish with a lot of very lateral compression is they move a lot of water very quickly. Um, and so they're gonna be high maneuverability. And then finally, there's a sort of weird one here is this dorso ventrally flattened. Um, and so that's a weird word, very scientific word. Essentially its head is short and wide. So like a catfish, you can, the extreme would be a flathead catfish not surprisingly from its name. So moving on to body pattern. Um, I think this can be very, very, very helpful. This is one of the first ones I, I usually click, um, but you do need to keep in mind that fish do vary um, within a single species um, as far as their color. So if you catch a largemouth bass in a reservoir that's very muddy, um, they tend to lose their greenish color Whereas a largemouth bass caught from a weed bed in some northern temperate lake, they tend to be very dark and green. Um, but at the core, they'll sort of still have what we describe as a modeling um, body pattern. Something else that needs to be covered here, um, which is very specific to fish taxonomy, is the difference between stripes and bands or bars. So you notice here one or more stripes and those stripes go laterally along the fish's side, whereas bands or bars are gonna go from top to bottom. Um, so the one way that I always sort of mess this up is you think of tiger stripes and tiger stripes would actually be tiger bars because it'd be more vertical. Um, so the nice part is here, there are photos to sort of make sure you don't click on the wrong one. But if you would have a fish that has bands or bars quickly, you could select the first one just because it's the first one. Um, so that is a good thing to distinguish. And again, the ecology of the fish often goes back to the coloring. Um, and that gives you some idea of what kind of habitat is it trying to blend into. And the last one, um, which is the easiest way to narrow any search is distinctive features. This is kind of the miscellaneous part of the app. Um, something like a, like a lamprey that has a giant sucking disc instead of a mouth. Um, that's weird. Uh, a paddle shaped mouth, also weird whiskers, this long snout with a bunch of teeth. All of these are gonna narrow you very, very quickly into um, generally one kind of fish family. Um, and it may only be a handful of fish species. So if they have any of those, absolutely click those um, first. Okay, so we've gotten to a fish you think it is. What's next? And what do these species profiles actually look like? So they're, they're really comprehensive um, and they're broken first into description, more photos and similar species, which is something I find very helpful. So if you click on description, um, there's gonna be a number of, of text that it's gonna give you. So it'll tell you things about the body, um, which will go into mouth or snout, body patterning, um, body shape. And something that I find very helpful is the typical size that we see this fish in Wisconsin. So for a smallmouth bass, um, the maximum in Wisconsin is generally going to be approximately 23 inches. So if you catch something and you think it might be a smallmouth bass, but it's 30 inches, um, it's probably not that. Um, you probably know what a smallmouth bass is if you were trying to catch a 30 inch smallmouth bass. So 
Um, often I will look at this because the photos aren't going to be super easy to tell how big the fish is. Um, but that text will be down here. So you're going to have some idea of what size range you're looking for. So something else that, like I said, that I come to probably the most often is the app is this selection of photos. And these photos are really, really great. Um, in many cases, they have these annotations, these arrows that are going to point you to certain places and then have a little bit of text um, about what are you looking at and what are you looking for. Um, so I find that really helpful to nail down exactly what I think that fish is. Um, it will also have juvenile stage photos. Um, so just a lot of photos here that, um, and a couple examples here I will show that I do very much use this. And the final thing is going to be similar species. So here, you know, you can click and I'm like, ah, I'm not quite sure it's a smallmouth bass. I think my, my smallmouth is a little greener than um, the smallmouth in the photos. Well, what it'll show you is this largemouth bass is very similar. And there will be, um, again, annotated photos that will tell you differences between those two. Um, so very, very helpful in sort of narrowing that down. Okay, so I've been talking for quite a while now. Um, so I have some examples that we can go through, but if there's any just uh, overarching questions first, I can sort of go back and revisit anything that may be uh, sticking out. The only question we have so far is that someone's curious about what the cost of creating and maintaining that app is. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> not, a, not a developer, just a, a user. <laughs> OK. That's the only question here. All right, sounds good. So we'll move into some examples where I find this app to be helpful. So we'll just start off here uh, with just one, one first fish here. Um, let's say you caught this fish um, out in a northern Wisconsin lake, let's say Trout Lake in Vilas County. And a couple of things you knew about this fish was you caught it from deep water. Um, and so you can sort of notice it's very silvery, which tends to be a deep water fish. But so as I sort of pull up my phone here, um, I don't know if you guys can see that, um, but as I look at sort of the, the main features of uh, by appearance, um, the first thing I'm gonna put in is the body pattern. Um, I notice this fish is a solid color and that narrows me down to 101 different matches. So I don't feel super confident I can figure it out from there. But one other thing I notice is the mouth seems to be shaped uh, forward. And so I would go to mouth shape, click terminal mouth, and now I'm down to 54, um, which I could feel pretty confident, but um, I thought about back spines, as um, I mentioned, that's a fairly easy one to determine. You can't tell from the photo here, um, but it does not have any spine up top. Um, so I would click no spines and already I'm down to 35 matches, which um, I feel pretty good about it. I don't feel confident in any of the other characteristics. So from there, I can start scrolling through many of these fish. And what I notice is um, it looks a lot like these different species of ciscos. So we have cisco, we have uh, bloater, we've got blackfin cisco, deep water cisco, short jaw cisco. Um, I can't really tell any difference between them. And with a little bit more reading outside the app, you would be able to figure out that um, there's only one species of Cisco in inland lakes. Um, the Great Lakes are where our Cisco diversity is. Um, but pretty quickly, I could figure out that um, this is a Cisco. Some of the other things it may look like would be some minnow species. But again, if you would click on those minnow species and look at what size they were, um, you would pretty quickly figure out that um, this Cisco is too big to be most minnow species. Um, and then, yeah, looking at more photos um, and similar species, you'd be able to uh, definitively figure out that that's probably a Cisco. Um, time, I'll skip that example. Um, but one, one way I recently used this, um, and I find myself doing pretty often, is when I fillet a fish, and I often am curious what was that fish eating and why did I catch it on the bait I did. So I'll often look in the stomachs of fish um, that I catch. And so quickly I was able to recognize a crayfish, um, a bluegill, another bluegill, but then there was this little guy down here. Um, maybe kind of the fish nerd ID guy. Um, I wanted to see if I could use the app to figure out what that was. And pretty quickly, um, as I was going through this example was I narrowed it down to this group. Again, not trying to get super into the species, but just to get an idea of what 
um, like family of fish this might be. And I realize it looks a lot like these darters and these darters uh, are quite colorful and much of the coloration is how you identify those fish. Um, but this is coming from a half digested uh, stomach sample. So I wasn't able to get past darter, but at least I was able to know um, that at some point recently this pike was eating a darter. And so I may want to know like what kind of presentations can I mimic a darter while fishing. And I'm going to skip that. And another way that I often get asked to sort of use this is um, by people that often want to know whether some fish is an invasive or a native one um, form. Because we have many fish that look very, very similar to each other, but one is uh, invasive, uh, depending on what range you're in, and another one can be native. And so this especially is important if you're trying to just Google image search um, some fish. So for example, if you were to ask, uh, you know, Google, let me see a photo of a snakehead, you're more than likely to get photos of our native species of bowfin. Um, and so if you catch something that you think is a snakehead and you accidentally go onto Google and there's a picture of the um, similar species of, of the native species of both, then you could uh, mistakenly try and kill that fish that was actually native. Um, and so I love going to this app where I know John Lyon's name down here. He's got some photos that are annotated of a fish and I know exactly what fish species that is so I can more confidently know um, whether something was native or invasive. And so this goes for even if you leave Wisconsin, um, you go to Illinois, when I go back to Pennsylvania, both these fish species are present. Um, and so if I catch them, I can figure out the, the main differences between the two. And the last example here, I think is pretty unique, it was pretty recent, um, was I got this email on a Tuesday morning. So the title was random fish jaw ID, what is this? And the text there was, so a friend of ours retrieved the following fish part from her dog's mouth on a walk. It sure doesn't ring any bells for me as far as Wisconsin fish go. It's about six inches long. And so receiving this uh, pretty early in the week on the morning, I was sort of licking my chops um, to see something like this, great distra distraction real quick off in the morning. Um, and so I sort of walked my way with the app trying to figure out given some of the photos that are on the app and some different size estimates, um, I wanna see if I could identify what fish this was. And so I had a likely suspect six inches for how big that is, um, it's pretty big. And it's called the Madison area, it was found in the Madison area. And so I immediately went and searched musky um, cause I suspected it might be a musky jaw. And so I started going through the photos and one of the first photos I saw here, um, I was looking at the top jaw, I had a really good look at the top jaw. And you notice those two like large sets of teeth at the top of the mouth and it's very rounded at the front and all the way through. When I look back at this, I can tell it doesn't look like a top jaw. Um, that sort of curve here at the center, it definitely has symmetry, um, seemed like it was most likely the bottom jaw of the fish. So I needed a better look at the bottom jaw. So I got this side view look. And what I noticed were these big teeth towards the back are way bigger and a different shape than what um, we were seeing here. Um, these seem to be much smaller teeth. But what I noticed here at the ends of this jaw was they aren't super cleanly cut. And what I realized was there's almost an deflection point, inflection point, sorry. Um, right there, that looks like that would sort of maybe be the bottom portion of the jaw. And then those larger teeth are probably missing from that jaw, probably because it's coming up at a, a steep angle. So it makes sense that it would probably break off of there. And so then I got to this um, photo and I was able to notice, oh, the, the teeth that would be there are going to be much smaller than these other teeth. Um, and that would sort of be this sort of bottom jaw padding um, of, of a muskie. And I specifically started noticing that each of these teeth have these weird little um, spiky lower portions. Um, and as I started thinking about sort of decomposition of a fish jaw like this, um, you could imagine that sort of a gum line would super easily um, go away if it's sitting out on a beach. And so the, the total size of each of these teeth is relatively minor in the front jaw um, of a fish like that. And so I was, with, um, able to at least suggest that most likely 
especially given uh, the fish in the Madison Lakes. This is probably a pike or a muskie um, and, a, and a bottom jaw of the fish, but it's likely missing the next back part. So um, it just sort of highlights how big a muskie jaw can be. Um, and so that was just a fun little um, puzzle solving experiment. Again, using the app because I had the confidence of those photos. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop it there. Um, thanks for tuning in and I'm more than happy to take any questions or my email is there for any follow up. Yeah, we did have one question. Someone was asking to put the information back up for the app to download, but then a very nice person in the chat put the website there. Just also let us know that it's tough to find it in the app store on your phone. So do go to that website that's listed in the chat and download it from there. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, def way easier. I don't think like Apple, whatever search engine is very good for this. Yeah. Okay. The other question that we had is someone's wondering within that app, is there specific habitat information for each fish? So specifically like what kind of bottom substrate it uses, you know, deep versus shallow water, certain plants that it enjoys to be found with. Yeah, so unfortunately that's not in the app. Um, I think it is something considering to add. Um, the app is sort of more taxonomy focused. Um, so often the way at least my students will use it is they'll try and figure out the species. They may narrow it down to a couple options. And then um, there's like some really good uh, USGS sort of um, species distribution maps. Um, you can sort of go look and go, okay, could this be a rainbow smelt? Um, and then you look and go, oh, no, rainbow smelt shouldn't be in my lake. Um, so it's probably not that. So, yeah, just some sort of follow up. Uh, yeah, reading often often comes about if you're really set on figuring out exactly what fish that is um, or, yeah, more information about the ecology of that fish. Awesome. So we can kind of use different tools in tandem here. All right. Yeah, yeah totally. Our next question, someone's wondering if um, about the different types of outreach that you're doing with the app. So they're wondering if the Wisconsin Department of Tourism promotes the app. They don't see it on their website, local chambers. You know, a lot of people would really like the app. So beyond the conference, how do you share this with other Wisconsinites? Uh, so part of it was just this first first major step. This was the first time I've ever done demoing the, the app. I use it in the class, but yeah, no, I think it is definitely underutilized. I try and introduce it to people as much as possible. Um, I do interact a lot in the public at boat ramps whenever I'm sampling. Um, and I often will sort of tell them about the app and try and get them to uh, go use it. But yeah, I think definitely from here, anyone in the audience sort of continue to spread the word. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big, big resource. I think it's got a lot of usability. Um, I think it is fairly straightforward to figure out um, by yourself, but yeah, there are certain tips and tricks that I've figured out. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do a lot of outreach um, here at the Center for Omnology. We have open houses. Um, so more than likely, I will continue to probably use this as some sort of small activity for open houses. Hey, and I'm going to, this is Titus Seilheimer, just a surprise special guest from Wisconsin Sea Grant. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I just want to say, you know, I'm glad you're using the app. And, you know, I also like to spread the word on it. And it, it is kind of an old app. It is more than eight years old. And think of how many apps you use that are that old that haven't really been updated. So we are updating it. And, you know, we are going to definitely spread the word more. Because if you can ID fish, you're going to be interested in fish. And you're going to be more interested in Wisconsin lakes. Yeah, totally. I mean... Yeah, when I first started using it in the class, John Lyons even asked if it still functioned. Um, but yeah, I mean, it. I think it did for eight years old, it doesn't actually look that old. Um, I think it, it, yeah, stood the test of time in my opinion. Yeah, someone said that you should do a Lake Tides piece on it. I bet that was Amy Kowalski <laughs> suggesting that one. Yeah, I'm more than happy as opportunities arise to, I, obviously this talk didn't take uh, an insignificant amount of time, so I'd love to do it again. <laughs> All right, let's see. And that one got upvoted, so people would love an article about that. Yep, I can see what I can do. <laughs> okay. 
All right, well, that looks like all of the questions that we have here today. So thank you so much, Ben, for sharing that tool with us. It seems like it'll be something that a lot of people will be using here now. Yeah, totally awesome. Thanks for having me.